Often it is said that metronome numbers and double beat, basically half of the value of what we make of them today, result in tempi that are half of that what we hear today. But that couldn't be farther from the truth. Only in very rare occasions we hear music performed according to the modern reading of the original metronome numbers. And many would be deeply shocked if they really would realize what a single beat application, if technically possible, would do to the music they care about. In this Too Slow series we compare performances of high quality of today to what could have been the intention of the composer. And today we have Vladimir Askenazi and his version of the Chopin's Farewell Waltz Op. 69, number 1. So welcome everybody to Authentic Sound. My name is Wim Winters and this channel is all about exploring the music from Bach to Beethoven and beyond with the single goal to inspire you on your journey as a musician or as a music lover. If you see it this way or are aware of it, but not playing according to what we know for sure was the original tempo of the composer is a huge deal breaker. We know that metronome numbers of that time, always, no exception, are exact, accurate speed indications of the tempi composers had in mind. So we also know, or should know, that when we do not follow their tempo indications, we are by definition not playing their music like them. So, without saying anything negative on the very expressive interpretation Askenazi gave to this famous Chopin waltz, there are some important elements of this performance that we might look into a bit closer. The piece was written as a definitive goodbye to the woman Chopin deeply loved, Maria Wodzinska whose mother would not allow her daughter to be too close to Chopin anymore. Not because he was not of the same class as her family, but of his, even in those days, problematic health. The deal was to stay healthy, at least one winter. But Chopin, a dandy and the purest sense of the word, followed the fashion of the season, which was not very warm and cozy, and so became ill. There were a kind of spies even following him secretly to check in on him and so Maria was taken from him forever. The manuscript was given to her in Dresden in September 1835 and is now in the National Library in Warsaw. Chopin never published it. It was only after his death that this magnificent piece saw daylight in the edition of Julian Fontana, one of Chopin's closest friends. Fontana, an important musician himself, is considered today as one of the closest sources for the interpretation of Chopin's music. That doesn't change the fact, however, that we do not have a metronome number for this piece other than that of Fontana and later editions. Moreover, the addition Lento to this piece is only to be found in Fontana's edition as well. It is the Fontana version that most editions today follow as most performers follow that version as well. The manuscript on which Fontana based his edition is lost. Interesting though is that the quarter note 138 which Fontana gave for this piece was never debated. We see for instance in the Kulak edition of a few years later a similar metronome number that of quarter note 144. Kulak, a student of Czerny, stood of course further from Chopin than Fontana, but was in the same tradition. 138 and 144 basically are tempi that are in the same tempo range, so to say. This little bit of background is important, since one could say that there is nothing to be said on this piece truly related to Chopin. Well, that's something that would be not even up for a debate. Though the metronome number is at least as close to Chopin as a Czerny or Marshallis number to Beethoven. But on the other hand, two important elements are to be stated here. Firstly, the metronome number and tempo indication of Lento are from Fontana's hand. It is at a minimum the way he played this piece. And secondly, and perhaps the most important element for this topic, are the ornaments in this piece. How do performers of today play those slurs of ornaments so typical for Chopin? Askenazi's way of playing can very well be regarded as a kind of standard today. 
There is surprisingly little difference amongst pianists for this piece. Even Arthur Rubinstein, not playing from the Fontana edition, but from the manuscript, basically in regard of tempo and performance of the ornaments, does not differ from this common practice of today. So, let's start to give you a few bars of Askenazi's performance. Askenazi plays this piece in a tempo that is around quarter note 118. Well, that's considerably slower than Fontana prescribes, but more importantly, let's have a look on what happens in bar 11, where the first variation on the melody is introduced. Askenazi takes back on his initial tempo rather a lot, to give room to the G-flat and to create space for the 16th rest and the 16th a beat for the next bar. The same happens, but more pronounced, in bar 27. Here, Askenazi slows down his basic pulse of quarter note 118 drastically to something around quarter note 72. There is no retardando written here by Chopin. We touch here upon a very interesting problem. Even though Askenazi is playing this piece considerably slower than Fontana suggests, at least if we take Fontana's metronome number literal, he feels, as almost all pianists today, the need to slow down at those ornamented passages so much that his tempo becomes, yes, half of that of Fontana or Kulak. Think about this for a moment. Or you could say that Askenazi slows down to exactly the tempo Fontana had in mind. Just read his metronome number metrically. So, taking into account two points instead of one, as a conductor's hand going up and down, so resulting in a metronome number of 8 notes, 138 or quarter note 69. I've made a lot of videos on that topic, enough to not mention the historical background here again. Just click on the information icon here on screen or in the link in the description box that will guide you to more information. The fact that a great musician as Askenazi feels the need to slow down in these passages to exactly double beat tempo is striking. We've seen the same thing happen in Polini's F minor etude in his last page. Also that video is in the info card here. Now let's put this in an historical context now. These ornamented runs, rhythmically different from the left hand, the note values in the left hand at least, is something what the 18th and early 19th century called tempo ribato. We've made a segment on this a long time ago and I'll link that video also here on screen. Basically, the idea of these kinds of almost improvised runs, very close to the bel canto style, rhythmically independent from the left hand is not something Chopin invented. He, of course was a master of the format that before him was applied by composers like Mozart, Haydn and Beethoven as well. Many of their slow movements have similar passages as Chopin's waltz and basically share the same difficulties of execution. Remember for instance Mozart's letter in which he wrote that people were astonished to hear him play in the right hand, rhythmically different, than in the left hand. It's exactly the same expressive element or tool Chopin is using a lot of times as well. So, what was the practice in his time? 
Would Chopin have slowed down as much as Askenazi and most other pianists do? In fact, we are extremely well informed on this. And with 100% certainty, we know that Chopin himself would not slow down. Let me share you a few quotes by students. One of his best professional students, Friedrich Streicher, born Miller, wrote, and I quote, Chopin required adherence to the strictest rhythm, hated all lingering and dragging, misplaced rubatos, as well as exaggerated retardandos. Je vous prie de vous asseoir, pray to take a seat, he said on such an occasion with gentle mockery. End of quote. Or Karl Mikoli, I quote. In keeping time, Chopin was inexorable, and some readers will be surprised to learn that the metronome never left his piano. Even in his much maligned tempo rubato, the hand responsible for the accompaniment would keep strict time, while the other, singing the melody, would free the essence of the musical thought from all rhythmic fetters. End of quote. Or Saint Sans through Pauline Viardot, I quote. Through Madame Vierdon, I learned the true secret of tempo ribato, where the accompaniment holds its rhythm undisturbed while the melody wavers capriciously, rushes or linges, sooner or later to fall back upon its axis. This way of playing is very difficult, since it requires complete independence of the two hands. End of quote. Or Georg Matthias, I quote. There was another aspect. Chopin, as Madame Camille Dubois explains so well, often required simultaneously that the left hand, playing the accompaniment, should maintain strict time, while the melodic line should enjoy freedom of expression with fluctuations of speed. End of quote. Or Willem von Lenz, the Russian diplomat, who studied both with Liszt and Chopin. I quote. What characterized Chopin's playing was his ribato in which the totality of the rhythm was constantly respected. The left hand, I often hear them say, is the choir master. It mustn't relent or bend. It's a clock. Do with the right hand what you want and can. End of quote. But there was also another reason not to slow down in passages like these. Klesinski, a contemporary of Matthias, who spoke to many Chopin students, wrote, I quote, Again, these ornamental passages should not be slackened, but rather accelerated towards the end. Rolantando would invest them with too much importance, would make them appear to be special and independent ideas, whereas they are only fragments of the phrase, and as such should form part of the thought, and disappear in it like a little brook which loses itself in the great river. So, listening again to Askenazi, it is out of discussion that this is an effect that, with absolute certainty, was not meant by Chopin. Even if we disregard the metronome number of Fontana and that of Kulak, our basic tempo for this piece should be one that allows us to keep rather strict time throughout the entire piece. And of course, giving and taking very subtle is something very close to Chopin's style, but not in the way we are used to hear this piece today. You as a piano player must take a tempo, at least if your goal is to follow Chopin's style, in which these ornaments, pauses, accents can all be given. It is as Leopold Mozart once wrote, Every piece has one or several spots that allow you to reconstruct the tempo frame the composer had in mind. So, also here, in this farewell waltz, therefore, the tempo Fontana gave to this piece, metrically read, would be a perfect choice. Far from what we today connect to this wonderful piece of music, but that might be our problem more than that of Chopin. I'd love to see you experiment with both versions of Fontana's tempo, so both quarter note 138 and 8 note 138, and share your ideas and thoughts in the comment boxes. Or better, link to your own performances and tryouts. Be open to the idea of experiment and change, I'd say, and spend your time wise. There is more value in five minutes of playing than in lengthy black and white discussions as I've seen develop recently. I've not recorded this piece in my entire life, 
We do this on my RR, but let's wait for the new piano forte to come. It will be a perfect instrument for this music. Help me keep my promise to that. And if you want to see more of this, then hit that subscribe button, also the bell icon next to the subscription button. And if you really want to push us all the way to keep going, you might want to become a patron for Authentic Sound and join a group of about 80 other supporters. We have monthly video calls in which we chat about anything, also tempo. Thank you and see you soon again. Bye.